used to be a college professor, and now I'm not. I write historical fiction. Um, and what that means is that I put myself into a character, and I try to figure out you know, what their life would be like, what her his experience would be like, what did people actually do in a particular moment in the past. And for this book, it's really like, do like do it in the road, because I'm writing about one of the most ribald, but also comic and tragic characters in, in literature. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, I wanted to just let you know, I've been doing talks, so the paperback of the book just came out on Tuesday. This is the launch of it. Uh, the hardcover came out in September, so you all, by not buying it, have saved money. Um, and I started doing talks about it over a year ago uh, in around the, the U.S. And, and in Europe, and uh, I have never done the talk that you're going to hear. Like, this is actually my first talk that refers to onanism right in the title. <laughs> so we're going to see how this goes. You're all going to be nice. And I have a supply of cookies, water, and wine up here. Anything can happen. Um, so here's the thing. How many of you have ever read and or seen Romeo and Juliet? Everybody has. And yet, what do we really know about Romeo and Juliet? The best production I ever saw of Romeo and Juliet was by Nature Theater of Oklahoma. Do any of you guys know these folks? Because they're here in New York. They are not, yeah, there's, there's a fan. Um, they are not nature theater, nor are they in Oklahoma. They are hipsters, probably within a stone's throw of where we sit right now. Um, and they do a fantastic production of Romeo and Juliet in which they called up people on the phone and said, tell me what happens in Romeo and Juliet. And then they transcribed word for word what people said. And they're different as dramatic monologues with people coming out on the stage and grand Shakespeare. Um, and it's hilarious to watch, and part of what's so funny is that as you're laughing at the idiotic things people say, you think, I'm so glad they didn't call me. <laughs> and I'm going to play you a clip. There are no clips of this on the internet, so if nothing else comes of this talk, you will have gotten to see this clip because they let me show it, but otherwise it's not posted. Um, sure happens. Is the white light on? It's it's splashing orange and the white light is on. Is that right? That should be fine. Okay. Oh my gosh! Two families, the Capulets and the Montagues, <laughs> I think. And the Capulets, <laughs> I remember that part. And they were <laughs> families that were feuding. <laughs> they had two young teenagers girl and a boy, and they fell in love. And then, because their families were fighting, they were told to stay apart. But of course, true love being the way it is, they found their way together. And there was a fight where I, the Romeo killed, I think it was his, Juliet's brother. And in the process, he was Injured, Juliet finds him. Ah, thinking he's dead, she kills herself. He wakes up, sees her, kills himself. How's that? Looking up, I could get my clothes to it. It's been years since I've read it. Oh, Romeo, oh, Romeo, where art thou, Romeo? Something or something, and you are the sun. <laughs> famous from there. And there was a nurse involved too. She had a nurse that, that helped them out some way. I can't remember exactly, but she had she had she had a big part in it. Jeez, now I'm gonna have to go back and read it. <laughs> better as it goes. Like people start talking about celebrities that they compare to it's really quite Osama bin Laden comes up and it's quite <laughs> And if you ever have a chance to see that or any other do live, I cannot recommend it strongly enough. So I was much like that. The title of Juliet's Nurse came to me and I had not read the play since I was in high school. I had seen some productions and seen some of the films, but I went back and read it. And it turns out that the nurse who we think of as minor and comic actually has the third largest number of speeches in the play. 
Juliet speaks more of her lines <coughs> to the nurse than she does to Romeo. And she is not just a comic character, but she is at land of body character, but she's also a tragic character. So the very first scene of the play, this is how everybody imagines her, including, I think, the illustrator for the book, because this is the Zeffirelli, that late 60s. Yeah. You know, if you, if you remember uh, Romeo's butt, then this is the version that you <laughs> um, and the But in the first scene that Juliet is in, um, the nurse is also in it. And Juliet has about eight lines, and the nurse has over 60. So she's always trying to steal the show. And um, it, she has one speech in particular, Lady Capulet has just said, she's about, Lady Capulet is about to tell Juliet that Paris, the prince's nephew, wants to marry her. Uh, and she turns to the nurse and she says, do you know how old my daughter is? This is a question that can be answered in three words. Yes, almost 14. But instead, she does this long speech. And the great news is that I am not going to read it to you. Um, the woman who recorded the audiobook of <clears throat> Juliet's Nurse. And you never, as an author, you usually never meet that person or know them, but we have a friend in common. So she actually recited it for me this weekend, and I'm gonna play her version of it. So this is the speech, you know how old my daughter is, and this is how she responds. <laughs> she was also really pregnant. Now she's no longer pregnant. She just had a baby today. Aww. And, uh, <laughs> Even or old. Of all days in the year, come Lammas Eve at night, shall she be fourteen. Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, were of an age. Well, Susan is with God, she was too good for me. But as I said, on Lammas Eve at night, shall she be fourteen. That shall she. Mary, I remember it well. Tis since the earthquake now eleven years, and she was weaned. I never shall forget it. Of all the days of the year upon that day, for I had then laid wormwood to my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove house wall. My lord and you were then at Mantua, nay, I do bear a brain. But as I said, when it did taste the wormwood on the nipple of my dug and felt it bitter, pretty poor, to see it tetchy and fall out with the dug. <laughs> Shake, quoth the dove house, t'was no need I trow to bid me trudge. Since that time it is eleven years. For then she could stand alone. Nay, by the root she could have run and waddled all about. For even the day before she broke her brow. And then my husband, God be with his soul, who was a merry man, took up the child. Yea, quoth he, dost thou fall upon thy face? Thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wit, will thou not, Jewel? <laughs> left crying and said, I, <laughs> to see now how a jest may come about, that I should live a thousand years, I never shall forget it. Oh, wilt thou not, Jewel, quote he, and pretty fool, it stint in and said, I. <laughs> So a number of things happen in the speech. It's like you're, she's playing Juliet's embarrassing home movies of Juliet's childhood. Right? The day that Juliet is weaned, and you learn that she's weaned by her putting wormwood on her nipples. Wormwood, if the closest you've had to it is probably absinthe. It's bitter, and the idea is, Bleh, I don't want to suck on that anymore. That uh, we hear about the nurse has a husband who has died, a merry man, who is making dirty jokes to this little kid. Right, the thing about falling backwards, yeah. or women falling backwards. A joke that the nurse repeats twice in this speech, just to make sure you have not missed her joke. But the first thing she says in this speech is, I know exactly how old Juliet is, because my daughter was born the same day but didn't live. Right? So like, that was totally fascinating to me, this backstory that gave me the, the place to start writing the book. Um, but it's a little bit weird, right? Like. Her daughter is dead, and now she's this other kid to nurse. And when I started doing research uh, into the 14th century, when the play and the novel are set, I discovered that this actually was really common practice, that families wanted wet nurses, and I'll talk about why in a moment, but they specifically wanted a nurse with fresh milk, but somebody who wasn't going to be distracted by their own child. So the hot market was mm -hmm. to find a woman whose own child had died. So there's a, a book that's based on the letters between a couple that lived in the 14th century. And in 1397, this woman 
of Margarita Zettini was writing to her husband, and she says that all of the good nurses seem to have vanished from the world. For some I had at hand whose babies were at the point of death, but now they say they are well again. Which is very upsetting. <laughs> Later on, there's another letter in April, good news. I have found one whose milk is two months old, meaning her child is two months old. And she vowed that if her babe, which is on the point of death, dies tonight, she will come as soon as it is buried, right? So like, okay, that's a little bit weird right there. Um, but it's a very common practice in the time. And one of the reasons that people wanted nurses is that they believe this is all like the theory of humors. Everything medical is based on the theory of humors in this time period. And they believe that semen is going to taint breast milk. So if you want to have sex with your wife, you don't want her breastfeeding your child. This is like complete bonkers medically, <laughs> but it has this effect that we do know, now remember, lessens, doesn't eliminate, breastfeeding lessens the chance that you are gonna ovulate. So if you wanna have a lot more kids, and this is 14th century Italy, they wanna have a lot more kids, then you would like your wife not to be, or like if you are the wife not to be breastfeeding because it's gonna, impact how many kids you have. So they were like doing the right thing for what they wanted, but they had the total wrong reasons for doing it. That was sort of interesting. Um, and there are all these guides about what to look for in a wet nurse, not too young, not too old, what her skin should look like, what kind of diet you should put her on, because you really want to make sure that you are like getting the right thing for your child. Now at the same time, of course, the most powerful image in Italy or Europe at this time, right, is the Madonna with the baby at the breast. So that although the nurse, or any wet nurse, is a servant in a family's house, and there are all these contracts and things that you do that might violate the contract and you would get fired, you also are seeing these images that are totally valorizing what you do for a living. Because there is no more important image than the Mary with the baby at the breast. Now, I've been talking about the 14th century. This is Botticelli, so it's later. And the images that would be around earlier were a little bit <laughs> this, is, this is probably earlier than 14th century, to be fair, but it would still be around on churches or shrines. You would see images that were hundreds of years old. And here she is with the baby Jay. Um, and in case it's not clear enough, let me just give you a little close-up. <laughs> That's so weird. But this is the sort of imagery that you would see in church. Like, there you are praying with your family, and that's what you're looking at. Um, another place that we know about nurses from moon, obviously childbirth is and always has been a, a sort of magical and completely terrifying time, right? So one of the things that was true in this time period is that there were all sorts of ritual objects that were meant to ensure a safe childbirth, the health of the mother, the health of the child, gifts that you would give, you know, particular amulets, charms in which you would have things written in the charm. Um, but one of the things would be the gifts that would go, they were called parto gifts. Parto, you know, is the Latin root for pregnancy. So uh, the parto gifts that you would give to a mother. And one of them, this is an example, this is a parto tray. So you would actually use this tray to serve food to the mother and to the guests who would come visit right after she gave birth. She'd be in a separate parto room if her family was wealthy enough. But it's weird because on the parto tray, is a picture of the parto room, right? So you see, this is the new mother in bed. She's being waited on by the servants. And here's the kid down here with the nurse, right? Like the kid is totally not the focus of attention in this room. Um, and this gets carried over not just from parto gifts, but then those scenes start to uh, show up in religious imagery. I re just remembered I have a pointer. I don't usually have a pointer, so I'm really excited. I'm going to use the pointer now. Um, so this is actually a panel from a church, but it's got a similar parto scene. So you tell me, like, what if if you are Lois? And I should say, I'm trained as a historian, but this is not my field at all. My first book is about a black woman who was a spy during the Civil War. I'm actually trained in African American literature and history. So like, I'm like you. I see this image, and I have to figure out what the hell it means. Um, so what are the things that, as historians, you might notice about this scene? The size of the people. Right, right. So, so like the one figure there is tiny, and I can't. I don't know if that's a child or. I think it's supposed to be a child. Like they have it. There's. You can see that there's a little bit of perspective. Yeah. Right? Like there's room perspective. But like, how we make? We just like, honey, I shrunk the lady. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes along. Other things. 
Love loneliness. Wait, lots of there are lots, lots of, people, of people, right? They're all women. But this is a really crowded yeah. space. What were you gonna say? And there are only two people who have halos, so. Right, so, so this happens to be, that's um, Mary being born. Uh, so that's Anne in the bed, and, and you know that because they have halos. As we all know, it's a slightly more difficult birth. The child is a halo, but they're all <laughs> <laughs> Other things that you notice? Yeah. What's the running figure on the way? This figure. Yeah. I think that she's just a, um, a servant coming to bring more treats, right? Because you've got all these guests. Yeah. We're feeding the, woman, the mother who's just given birth, but we're going to feed the guests too. And the, it's an exterior staircase, which would be really common for the architecture of that period. Everybody's really static, except Yeah, yeah. She's like, um, and maybe it's because she hasn't come inside, so she's not doing enough better eating. Mm. <laughs> and somebody, I was, yeah. I think the major thing, though, is that, especially if you look at modern pictures of mothers, like this holding a baby Right, so the baby is with her nurse. The mother seems to be like, oh, I was hoping for something. I'm starved. I'm so glad. <laughs> this is my favorite dish, right? So again, and this is Mary and Anne. So like, if you were going to see this in a parto room, this would be a logical place to see it, but it's just totally not happening. <clears throat> um, yeah, probably I could go on about this for a long time. But I probably you always have on. very high receiving hairlines. Yes, that's the style of the day. They don't look great. But, but one of the things that's weird is, this, I mean, do these people look like they live in Bethlehem in the year 30 you know, BCE? No. Right. So, th so this is fantastic for a historian because they are putting their own clothing and food and architecture, including their ritual practices about like who has the baby, into the scene. So it's totally fantastic for me to have these kinds of sources. Um, so I'm going to read you a scene from the novel that takes place in the Parto room. Um, and here's what you need to know. You already know that the nurse's own daughter has died. Uh, her husband, Pietro, has arranged for her to come be the wet nurse. And I don't call them the Capulets, because Shakespeare, really good writer. History and cultural accuracy, a little bit iffy. So Capulet and Montague, not the most Italian sounding names. We know that they're supposed to be in Verona. So I call them the Capoletti in the book. Um, and the nurse has just come there. So she is a person who is not wealthy, entering the house of a family that is wealthy and powerful, which is a great move for those of you who are creative writers, because it gives her an excuse to describe everything that she sees. Um, so that's what, what we're going to be hearing here. Um, and also notice that my nurse, like Shakespeare's, I hope, um, can go from the tragic to the comic and back again to look when she's, when she's being funny. And sometimes people will say, like, so what mattered back then? Did class matter or did gender matter? And I will leave that to you to decide as you hear the scene. This is her first night in the house. When next I wake, the room is filled with golden light, and all Verona smells of yeasty bread. It is Lammas Day, a harvest feast. Sown seeds reaped as grain, then ground and baked to rounded loaves. Oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong scene. <laughs> <laughs> I told you the wrong scene, I'm sorry. Like, oh, right, sorry. Uh, here we are. Forget that. <laughs> that was an extra tease. Juliet has a ferocious hunger rousing herself six or seven times during our first night to nurse. I do not bother to lace my blouse, keeping a breast ready so that she'll not cry and wake the house. But to feed her, I must be fed. In some quiet hour, hungry from her hunger, I steal up to the table beside the parto bed, where remnants of Lady Capuletta's supper remain. A candle flickers beneath a portrait of Saint Margaret. Is it any wonder the saints favor the rich for offering up such extravagant devotions even while they sleep, when the rest of us can barely afford to keep a candle lit upon a work table when we are full awake. In the dancing light, I pick the darkest of the meat. Even cold, it is the finest I have ever eaten. I close my eyes, sucking poultry flesh from bone, savoring the flavors until I feel another set of eyes upon me, Lady Capuletta's. I slip the purloin bone inside my sleeve so I'll not be called a thief. But well fed as Lady Capuletta is, she does not seem to mark the food I've taken without leave. She stares at my untrust breasts. Is that what they do to them, she asks? Suckle like piglets till they fall flat? 
Standing so close beside her parto bed, I see she's hardly more than a child herself, consumed by girlish fear at what her body is, what it will become. Time will do what time will do, I say. No one stays. I peer at her and make a careful guess. 14, forever. She looks down and says, I'm already turned 15. An age when bud turns into bloom, I tell her. An age that is but a third of my own. Her face, her neck, are smooth as a statue. Her bead and braid strung hair shining. Lady Capuletta is that beauty the poets call a just plucked rose, and gossiping old dowagers call a coin that's not yet spent. Wondering that this is not enough to please her, I add, and blessed that your child is healthy. She cannot know what those words cost me. So what if it is, she asks. Not it, I say, she, a beautiful daughter of a beautiful mother. Some hard emotion pulls at the edges of her pretty mouth. A mother who should have borne a son, she says. You are young, there will be sons yet. I am young, but my lord husband is not. She shudders when she says his name. Neither is he patient. Surely tonight, all her husband's thinking of is how much it costs to dowry the daughter of so fine a house. That will shrivel more than a man's impatience. <laughs> but who am I to tell her so? He'll climb right back upon me, she says, to make a son. Fear tinges her words. Perchance it's more than age that makes them ill-matched. He must run hot, as men do, and she cold, as I for one do not. Although never having seen her husband, I cannot say whether there is anything in him that might please any woman, especially one barely out of girlhood. The midwife will tell him he must wait, as all men do, I say, thinking of how my husband Pietro brought me here out of our marriage bed. Her fingers, heavy with pearl rings, tug at the golden garnet cross that hangs around her neck, then turn the coral bracelets upon either wrist. Extravagant talismans, doubtless from her husband's family, which no one thought to unclasp at night so she might sleep in comfort. She's sorely in need of mothering herself, new mother though she is. I could sit upon this grand bed, stroking her hair and whispering soothing words until her hands lie calm. I might tell her that many a wife whose husband gives her no pleasure in the getting of babies still finds great joy in the children she's born. But Juliet begins to stir, and I turn my back to the parto bed to take up the child who is my charge. Woo!